Hola, buenas noches. Muchas gracias a todos y a todas por venir. Vamos a iniciar la actividad de hoy. Hoy tenemos el gusto de recibir a Giovanna Borassi, la directora del Canadian Center for Architecture. Eh, creo que es un lujo tenerla a Giovanna porque su trabajo junta todos los ciclos que venimos desarrollando de manera permanente en el CEAC. Por un lado, la idea del trabajo de los demás, eh, trabajando en un archivo todo el tiempo, difuminando y expandiendo la construcción cultural a través del estudio de los documentos de la arquitectura. El otro ciclo de miscelánea, donde tenemos otras formas de ser arquitecto, otras maneras de trabajar en relación al entorno construido, con prácticas que no solamente tengan que ver con construir. Y por último, el ciclo relacionado a las actividades del archivo de Itela, iniciado el año pasado, buscando construir desde la escuela un lugar de documentación y estudio de arquitectura argentina. La presentación de Giovanna es en tándem con la exhibición que vamos a inaugurar mañana, curada por Martín Uberman, profesor de la escuela y el docente, titulada Me conociste en un momento extraño de mi vida, que trabaja sobre la arquitectura en Buenos Aires después de la crisis de 2001. La exhibición cuenta con material del archivo de la escuela, con el material de docentes, de la escuela, como Marcelo Faiden, Sebastián Adamo, Josefina Espósito, Juan Campanini, Ana Smud eh, y varias personas más. Así que todos invitados mañana a la inauguración a las 19 horas y después por redes sociales iremos comentando otras actividades complementarias más adelante. La semana que viene vamos a volver a tener actividades en el CEAC, solo que un día distinto. El miércoles vamos a recibir a la historiadora Alejandra Monti, que estará haciendo una presentación sobre la Fundación Ford y, sus impacto, y su impacto en los estudios urbanos en la década del 50 y el 60. Como siempre, pueden consultar el calendario de las actividades de la escuela online. Si no tienen póster, se pueden llevar uno acá o me piden al final. Eh, bueno, y sin más, le cedo la palabra a Isabela Moretti, directora del archivo, para que nos introduzca un poco más el trabajo de Giovanna. Gracias. Hola, Iván. Bueno, buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Voy a pasar a leer primero la biografía que también encuentran en la web en español para después sí pasar al inglés. La charla va a ser inglés, en inglés. Eh, Giovanna Borassi es arquitecta, editora y curadora. Se unió al Canadian Center for Architecture, mejor conocido como el CCA, en 2005 como directora asociada de programas y fue curadora de arquitectura contemporánea y luego curadora en jefe hasta el 2020, antes de asumir como directora. Desde este rol, Borassi supervisa la trayectoria curatorial del CCA y los procesos de revalorización institucional. El trabajo de Borassi explora maneras de hacer arquitectura que desafían la definición convencional de la arquitectura y que yacen en el corazón de la dialéctica entre cambios sociales y disciplinares. Borassi estudió arquitectura en el Politécnico de Milano, Trabajó como editora en Lotus International y Lotus Navigator. Y fue editora en jefe de la revista Habitare. Bueno, ahora sí, paso al inglés. Um, I want to highlight Giovanna's editorial trajectory, which I just read, for two reasons. Firstly, as an acknowledgement to the school's team, well, since last year, Javier Roja, Florencia Medina, and I um, have taken on diverse roles within the school, uh, public programming, executive direction, and the archive, respectively. And we started our professional journey from a press room, una sala de redacción. And from there, we developed our skills in doing architecture through different mediums, always promoting collective and alternative conversations. This leads me, secondly, to the publication and exhibition curated by Giovanna, the other architect, Uh, which had its local iteration at the Monambiente Gallery, directed by Martin Uberman, in September 2016. The top catalog can now be seen at the library on the second floor. This exhibition identified experiences, especially from the 1960s onwards, uh, that, quoting Giovanni's curatorial text, adopted this alternative position and dared to 
venture beyond the limits of traditional architectural practice, the pre-established territories of the academic world, and the usual dynamics of editorial and institutional activities. Motivated by their desire to contribute more substantially to the construction of a cultural agenda, these practices critically analyze their function and challenge the precepts and ultimate goals of the discipline. I take this opportunity not only to invite all of you to tomorrow's opening and the architecture workshop at 7 p.m. of the newest collaboration between uh, Martin and the CCA, um, but also to celebrate and continue recognizing these alternative modes of practice that are still today sometimes under-recognized or marginalized. The Canadian Center for Architecture is an international research institution, archive and museum, premised on the belief that architecture is a public concern. They do exhibitions and beautiful uh, publications that have their extensive collection at the center. This is also communicated through different public programs, internships, and residencies to host a range of other activities driven by a curiosity about how architecture shapes contemporary life, as announced on their website. The CCA's founder and first director, uh, Phyllis Lambert, started collecting architecture-related documents in the year 1979. And it is for us at the Ditela Architecture Archive and Institution definitely of res uh, reference that we keep track of. So today, uh, Shawana will mainly be presenting CCA's most recent work, which understands documentary film as a medium and the key curatorial element for reflecting on contemporary social conditions from architectural thought and habitation. I believe her work at the CCA aims fervently and with a critical eye to shift or even break Albeit with utmost subtlety, the modern institution to its new model of a plural and accessible institution. It draws from ideas of unarchiving, as described by Andres Tello, for example, or extitution by Andres Spicer, to understand the operations that challenge archives today. This suggests that the issue of the archive and its institution is no longer an exclusive concern of archival professionals or the preparatory input for historiographic work, but rather becomes a kind of cross-cutting access in the critical reflection of various areas. A node that promotes the intersection of knowledge, investigative practices, and epistemological questioning. Thank you very much. Um, muchas gracias, Isabella, por esta generosa introducción. Uh, el mío español es minimal, entonces voy a pasar al inglés. <laughs> so, thanks a lot. Uh, oh, this is too dark. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so, thanks a lot for inviting me and the CCA in the school. Um, and also was a great excuse to be back here in Buenos Aires, a city that I love. And so I want to thank Isabella, Agustin for the invitation, Marcelo for really um, pushing the school in all these uh, new endeavors and um, a shift that is also visible from the outside. And um, a special thanks to Martin Huberman, who has been the first person who invited me here in Buenos Aires. And then all the kind of connection with the city and love with the city started with this encounter. So I look also very much forward to tomorrow night to see the uh, work we have done with um, Martin in the, the years. He, he worked with the CCA, but because of the COVID only happened in, in a digital way. And, Thanks again to the school for realizing this show in, in, in a way that we can actually share it with, with everyone. Um, so um, what I thought I would want to share with you is a way, in a way, the, some of the research we're doing at the CCA, and I think they all touch upon this question of um, expanding the idea of context for an architect. and. Um, 
I think it's a lot of trouble then for architects if we expand this idea of context, but I think it's very important to think about all of these. But before doing that, I just want to go back and maybe come back to this event that was the last time I was here in, uh, in Buenos Aires where we had a, a very, I would say, emotional uh, event. Uh, there was a lot of crying, I have to say, and uh, um, a good one, like I think was a very, yeah, was an important moment where it was a way of signaling the fact that the archive of Amancio Williams was leaving Buenos Aires and going to the CCA. And this was one of the events we, um, we created with, with Martin and was this idea of what's called Querido Amancio. And many people were asked to write a letter to Amancio and, and explain their interest in his work or the love or the not love for, for him, for the family, for what he did, for what he meant. And, and so on. And so um, actually all those letters are now in the CCA um, website, also with audio, if there was really the person uh, there, this is the one, the son, Claudio, I wrote for him that he actually cared for the archive until the moment the family decided to donate it to the CCA. But um, it was a very interesting um, event, not only because really captured this um, moment, this um, particular moment of, you know, passing the material to one end to another, but also because this established a kind of first uh, research base for people coming to see the archive. There is a lot of details in the letters that I think is already a first, um, a first um, basis for people to then look into the archive and start also to make the connection uh, that some of this letter uh, reveal. Um, so the, um, you know, a Kurt Foster, who was a director of the CCA um, some years ago, really argued that, you know, the collection has no value if it's not used. And actually the value of a collection is established by the use we do of it. So what we do at the CCA with the collection is really trying to activate it uh, as much as possible and really put it in dialogue with the, also with contemporary practices. So we don't see a kind of um, line between past and present. I think we think that the kind of past ideas and past experience can really help a lot to define the kind of current practices and ideas. So uh, what is happening now, and there's a series that we started some years ago, it's called Out of the Box, and uh, we are now is happening in CCA around the Mancio, and you have here Claudia Schmidt, I'm sure is here, here she is, um, looking into especially the correspondence of, of that are present in the archive. Um, Studio Moato on your right hand, uh, looking at the uh, cross project, and then Sofia and Peso, they are really looking at the Casa La Royal. And uh, so this is, a, is um, a curatorial program that we created um, uh, some years ago, um, because I have to say we did an exhibition that was extraordinary with uh, um, the historian um, Tony Biedler on James Sterling. And I spent a lot of days in the vaults looking at James Sterling. Uh, drawings, and I felt that uh, was amazing for me to spend time with with Tony Wheeler and learn of his perspective. At the same time, I would have wanted to also have other perspective on the same drawings, on the same archive. And so we created this program. That the idea is that, in a way, it's one archive, but the the uh, idea and the perspective are kind of is non monographic in the sense that three people invited can have a very different take. On even contradictory somehow. And this, I think, helped the public to already, from the beginning, start to see that an archive is, very, is potentially extremely rich of ideas and, and can be, um, yeah, produce very different reading. So uh, we have now on the first show that is the one curated by Studio Moato and that are really um, looking at the church and the airport uh, project. And they really try and kind of to explore the infrastructure dimension of William's work, 
but also this idea of all these projects that are working on, in a way, not touching the land or kind of building a kind of horizon. Um, Claudia, that will be soon, so we don't have yet a photo because in, the design is in the making. Um, she's really looking at all the letters and how obsessively Amancio kept the one he sent, the one he received. And this is also showing the network he had, the kind of dissemination of the work he wanted to have, the kind of, um, yeah, the, 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 his desire of really sharing his work um, beyond, beyond Argentina. And, um, and, and so all this kind of political and cultural connection that he had. And then, as I said, Sofia and Peso will, are looking at, um, at the Casa del Arroyo, especially at the kind of detailed drawing. Um, and they really think this were not needed in a way to build a house. So it's very interesting how many details he made or made many, many details of the same thing as it was like this kind of intimate obsession with some of the kind of details and so on. So stay tuned, more, uh, more, more ideas will come from this. And um, this is, as I said, is a series we had worked on the archive of Pablo Serreros. Um, this is the show that the uh, office, Carson David Van Severin did in 2015. Um, it was a surprise for me because actually they spent many days in an archive and I, I hope you are using the archive that has been established here at Ditella. An archive is always a surprise because you might know the practice of an architect and the archive might not be exactly what the practice is about. You discover other things and so on. So, Kerstin and David were fond of Iñaki and Juan work. And then after a week in the archive, they were like, what the hell is this archive? It's like all these um, very detailed drawings um, with a lot of you know, things on it and so on. So as I say, surprisingly, I, they decided actually to work on the digital archive of Iñaki and Juan because they were then able to in a way, um, free the drawings from all this additional information and really look at the typology simply. So what you see on the table are actually the kind of cleaned digital drawings. So cleaned in a sense that we hide some of the, um, of the information. The archivists were not super happy because this will be manipulating the archive, but that's also the kind of new possibility with digital archives because in a way you're not manipulating the archive, you're manipulating a copy of it. So, Anyhow, very interesting conversation. Start from that. So um, their idea was like this idea of um, industrial architecture. So somehow the idea of this typology that are kind of recurring as it will be a kind of industrial idea of, of architecture. Uh, Juan Casellon worked at, the, on, at this um, high tech, um, the idea that some of the kind of early idea of um, uh, sustainability or environmental ideas of, of Abelo Serreros. And you don't see in the photo, but one, uh, one in each exhibition there is an element of, an intangible element of the archive. So um, here what you have, this structure we actually rebuilt was actually a structure of a show that Iñaki and Juan did um, that they couldn't, was in a historical building, so they couldn't use the walls. So they built this kind of machine where you actually see uh, the slides uh, and there was a display, this was a kind of display of an object. So we had this idea of reenactment of the archives so that there will be always a kind of a piece that will you know, reenact part of the archive that actually doesn't exist, but is present. Um, so obviously that, and here you don't see it, but um, Juan Jose uh, worked in the office and he said that the, all this architecture of that moment was actually had a very specific soundtrack because there was a certain music that uh, they will hear that was um, Spanish punk rock. So the interesting things was that we rebuilt the, and that moment was like, you will not work and everybody has the headphone. There was a music and everybody gets the same music at that time in the office, or even also when I was a student, that was the thing. Uh, so, um, yeah, so all this architecture was produced with a soundtrack of punk rock. And so when you enter in the show, this was what you were hearing. And so it was an interesting 
contrast between the ideas and, and the soundtrack. And this was um, so ill. So again, the carpet, for example, is again reusing an idea of, um, of um, Iñaki and Juan that was actually taken um, um, uh, and, and kind of exploded in this kind of pixelated thing and was all the idea of, of showing their collages on the landscape and this idea of kind of zooming out and, and so on. So um, as you see, the, the exhibition really track a very different part of the work of uh, Iñaki and and Juan. We did another one on Gordon Mata Clark. We have the archive of Gordon Mata Clark, and this is uh, by Jan Chatenier, and um, is actually uh, looking at the um, library of, of Gordon Mata Clark and uh, how many of his work and ideas were influenced by actually the books we was uh, reading. So. Um, it's very interesting that sometimes when we have archive, we get also the donation of the library of the architect or the artist, and sometimes our annotated libraries. So you really see what the person was intrigued, interested in, and, and so on. Um, Ila Peleg, we have of Mata Clark also all the uh, rough cuts of his film. So she really worked on all, all these parts that were, didn't make it in the movie, but somehow are very interesting. So this is... Um, the project he did in Paris near the Pompidou, the conical intersection. And finally, Kitty Scott worked on uh, his uh, uh, travel photo and vacation uh, trips and so on, and started to actually see some of the um, his obsession in, in, in his also his kind of personal and family trips. Um, this is not the only program that we have on archives. We have uh, something that we call find and tell. These are some, some of the people who came to the CCA. So uh, we invite architects or historians to come in dialogue with uh, um, an archive. So the last one is Fala, who just were there last week, uh, to look at the Umberto Riva archive. And um, <coughs> it's, it's a very interesting process. They they stay for a week, so they have to come with an agenda because it's impossible to see the archive in a week. And um, this is connected to um, a project of digitization somehow. So what what we do is that they stay for a week. They they will be interested in a, in a certain aspect of the work of one of the archive we have. And then we ask them to select, basically in this process, a thousand of drawings, and then we digitize all those drawings they have selected. And then there is an essay that they write in relation to that. So the digitization is not done in a kind of massive and, and undirected way. Somehow we go by batches and then we, we digitize what this architect or historians or critic has suggested us. And then maybe in a few years, we invite another person to work on CISA, and then we will then digitize another part of it. So there is always a reason why, yeah, why, a person, uh, why something is, is there and, and digitizes somehow. So, and we now have a program that this push this even further, uh, that we started in in Africa, when we started to work with some African scholars, the question was about the archive and what will happen there if we want to start to, you know, see archives, bring them to the CCA and so on. And we thought, and discussing with historians, this will be, again, a kind of um, not the right approach to have a kind of extractive model. So. We have now been working with a different idea that I think is also connected to the fact that uh, with this kind of new digital opportunities that we have, maybe the role of an institution like the CCA is to really be able to connect scholar and researcher and architects to some material more than collect that material. So what we're doing is that, uh, and we have been working with an archive in Sudan uh, before that everything happened in Sudan, is to hire their PhD students or, or scholars, identify in an archive. They make the selection of the thousand important things in the archive. We invest in the digitization, and then all those images are put in Wikimedia. 
So it's not in our website because it's not our collection. So are they in Wikimedia? They can be described in many other language than French and English. Everybody can contribute. And then we invite people to use that digital collection. So that's the kind of new phase we are working on, really trying to push the, yeah, the kind of sharing of, of the work of architects globally. Um, so I thought I will just give a little bit this context because I know that you, you know, you are, you're having this archive and I'm, I think there are many potentials. And so I just wanted to share some of the ideas that, uh, that we have around that. But if I go back to kind of maybe the core of, of my talk tonight is um, really to share an approach that we have at CCA that, um, yeah, that architecture is not just building, it's really a much more extended uh, way of, of thinking. And I think uh, that space uh, has always expressed a kind of societal states. It's a beautiful series of, of photographs by Paul Graham, who um, are called a television portrait because all the people he photographed are actually looking at the TV, like you don't see the TV, but you see the, that the attention of the, here's a kid. But, uh, um, so somehow I think the, the reading of the space and in relation to society is one of the kind of key, key things that we're interested in and, 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 and um, yeah, to research and, and think about. And I think the issue we have in this moment is that, um, if you will imagine that society and architecture are always kind of connected, I feel in the kind of present moment they are a bit out of step. And somehow society is asking certain question and maybe architecture is not really there to kind of respond to some of this question. But I think um, I think there is an opportunity for architecture to kind of sense all these changes and this shift and really give uh, some some configuration. So what you see here is, um, is actually a, a hugging room. Like this is something that um, in the States is coming up uh, more and more. So in this kind of new situation where there are a lot of people who live alone or feel alone, I, I don't think it's something that you might have here. You hug each other very, very much. So it's not even just a stranger you encounter for the first time, but this is coming up in other cultures. And, and so what is happening is this new architectures, like, like this one, a kind of room, all soft, all uh, where people go to hug other strangers, not in a kind of erotic sexual way, but just hug. And, um, and so this is one of the things that are coming up. And there is some, some I think there is a space for architecture to think about of like, how we can then facilitate situation where people can meet, encounter, have dialogue, sit together and so on, and kind of support these needs of exchange somehow. And I think, yeah, I think that um, the question is also that all these new spaces also bring kind of new rituals. And I think the connection between architecture and rituals is very important and has always been like this. It's like the space all the ritual and a ritual needs a space. And so I think there is a kind of need to think all the, what are all these new rituals and what are the spaces related to that. So we start to see many shifts. Here you have a work of, of an artist of that is also depicting this that is happening or people who have a non-human presence in their house. Um, and so what it means to have that to have a kind of future robot or a future non-human. And so this person, this new entity will need a room, what, what, uh, how they will live, I don't know. So all these are new questions. There are new family um, that are, this is a work by a photographer on the, the kind of emerging refugee crisis. So these are new put together families where you might have um, you know, family, another family joining. So then you have a kind of new family constitution. Um, we start to see things like 24 hours daycare. People need, because of the economic pressure, to maybe leave their kids for they have multiple jobs. So they have to kind of leave their kids 
with someone and so somehow the, the um, this idea of a 24 hours daycare where kids can stay there at night if people work at night and and other situation where people decide to leave the city i think we have seen a lot of this during the pandemic and like go to live in kind of community um many of these things are not new but somehow i think there are all these shifts and i think um yeah i think that architecture needs, needs to kind of look at that and listen to these changes to understand uh, kind of what is the kind of current agenda. So we have worked on, on a research project where we tried to see traces also where architects are already start to think about all these issues. And I know you will see Go soon. This is a project by, by Go Azegawa. And um, for him it's a house on a slope. And when I, it's, it's literally a house on a slope, but when I visited and I kind of pushed Go um, and he, he always laughed about my reading of it, but basically the house is a room here on the top, and it's a house where a young couple live with the mother of the girl. And so here upstairs you have a kind of living room, living room, kitchen and bathroom, and the room of the mother, and the couple live down here. Now this loop is very tough. So the mother lives upstairs with a dog, and they live downstairs with a cat. And I tell you, it's impossible for the dog and the cat to move up, but also for the mother to go down. So it's only one space, there are no walls, but somehow the slope creates this kind of divide in the family, but at the same time, a kind of communal way. Go will not describe this house in this way, but I tell you, this is the reality. And somehow the young couple here has their own privacy, they have their own garden on the side of the slope, and this become this kind of intermediary space. They can use it to project movies and so on. And um, yeah, they kind of cohabit in the same space. So I think this new reality where, where people will need to take care of the kind of aging, um, older parents, and they have to move together, or the reverse, as we've seen, young people who have to go back to live with their parents, these new questions of like how you cohabit and you might not want to go back to your, you know, the room you were living when you were 10 years old uh, is a kind of new question for architecture. Um, this is um, it's an horrible plan. So it's, I'm not showing this as a kind of example of architecture, but again, this is a group of architects who ask themselves about um, divorced couples and you know how you kind of keep the house for the kids so basically the house was reorganized so the kids are the only one who can go freely from the two parts so that one parent live on one side one parent live on the other side and the kids are the only one who kind of freely use the entire house and so on so again thinking that this the society is going in a direction where there are more um, co-parenting another model and so what it means to a kind of housing stock. Um, the other question is really the relation with our neighbors and I think this project by Sam Chervayev in, in Berlin is a very interesting one. Um, basically uh, there are two apartments and there is this space that is negotiable between the two apartments. So in a way when you buy the property, you buy a percentage of the floor, and then this space can become many things, can become um, a kind of shared space between the two flats, or you can decide that you own it, or the other person own it, or maybe you live all together, or maybe you decide that this is a kind of shared space that you kind of decide. So the idea that... Um, the, the, the organization of a plan floor, a floor plan is not anymore in kind of separated unit, but more this idea of thinking of the relationship with your um, neighbors, I think is a kind of interesting one to think it's, uh, yeah, in the future. Um, the other things, as, as I say, there is many more people living alone for many different reasons. Um, we live longer. Um, economic uh, uh, pressure uh, of like means that you live alone, you have to have a kind of 
shrink down in a kind of smaller space and so on. And this, I think, um, is a very interesting project by this Japanese architect, Ifei Takahashi, where he basically designed a home where each um, each room become, in a way, one apartment. And the way he explained it is that, um, you know, you will not, if you live alone, you will not use all the functions, especially in, in Japan, you might eat often outside or you might, so, so the idea is that the traditional function of the home are all divided and each one gets a room. So you might live in a bathroom or you might live in the kitchen or you might live in the office. And um, and then if you want to use the kitchen, you might have to talk with your neighbor and negotiate the use of his kitchen and, and so on. So um, on this question of living alone, uh, we have actually done um, a documentary and really using Ipe um, Takahashi project as a kind of uh, one of the main projects featured. And this is part of a series of of film that are really work looking at the at the, uh, the kind of urban challenges that we have now. So the one about living people living alone was the second one. The first was about homelessness, and the third one is about aging population. Let's see if this works. I'm not sharing. Huh? No, what is happening? Sorry. Ah, okay. Let me see. 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 まあ、住宅内部に完結するというよりは、まあ、住宅内部に完結するというよりは、まあ、住宅内部に完結するというよりは、まあ、住宅内部に完結するというよりは、まあ、住宅内部に完結するというよりは、まあ、住宅内部に
we were also cautious in, in thinking, you know, like what will then, then be the future of all this. Somehow this over-specialization um, is also certainly a kind of risk in a kind of long-term um, stability of, of, of the city somehow. Um, now, the other things we have been looking at is um, the question of affordability. And in all this, there is also the fact that we are continually building things, but who will be able to buy them or afford them? And, and this is a work by an artist. Again, this might be a kind of North American problem, but uh, students are basically in debt before even starting to work and and uh, you know to pay off those, lo those loans means that you need to yeah to um, accept certain work or live in certain condition that you have to pay back this so uh, I think another interesting area of, of work is really to look up like what it means new models where people can can cohabit share uh, pay in in a kind of yeah different ways and I think dogma with this work of promised land, they looked uh, on a kind of different um, potential models of also how, how, you know, the funding is done, how the, the, um, the uh, users are involved in the making. And so they have been looking of different system cooperative and things like this, or, or, you know, labor where you can really put your own labor in it in order to kind of build a home you want to build. Um, I don't have it here in the slides, but I think also uh, there are Jack Shelf. Jack Shelf has been working a lot on this idea of like kind of different models where um, you don't pay a rent, but you basically, is, instead of taking a loan from a bank, you basically pay a, whatever you deposit, it becomes a percentage of buying. So what you you pay every month in a condominium is actually percentage of the condominium that you are buying. And so after 10 years, you can say, okay, I, I sell my component uh, or you can buy more if you want to stay and expand. So um, I think this is a, a, also a crucial question in the future that architect will need to kind of get involved in order to yeah, think models that are affordable and make sense to produce, but also that they have a kind of, their response to a kind of user needs. Um, this is a very basic answer um, that I kind of like of this uh, Swiss architects. They, they developed a, a, a kind of wall that has all the kind of, um, you know, on one side, all the kind of uh, bathroom things and on the other side the kitchen and so the idea is that you you know you the apartment at the beginning is this is the only things you have and then you know with while staying in time you will start to kind of add on other elements yourself um, but this is the kind of minimum set that you have and then and then you are able to you know living in to expand it in accordance to your um, economical um, capability. So, um, as I said, the the what have, we have been looking is also the question of homelessness, and this is sort of like the first documentary that we did was related to that. And uh, um, um, we have seen it uh, growing and growing. The the amount of people are living in the streets. And uh, uh, I think the question of housing is a very present um, yeah, question. So we have been looking in two, two places in Los Angeles where the crisis is, is overwhelming and in Austria. And the answer is, is, is very different. What you have here is Michael Molson project that you probably know is, is an old project that's shown many times. Um, uh, that um, really wants to make an architecture that is visible and make a point of like this population is invisible. And so I want to make an architecture that is very visible so that the, the issue is there in the face for, for everyone to see. And, and here you have an Austrian architect who actually built with, the, with an institution this um, 
this place that you see in the middle is actually an existing building that was readapted. But the very interesting things is that uh, this is a house where homeless and students, or prior homeless and students, they live together. And so they share apartments. And um, so the, the question has been also of like, how you also integrate this population back in, into society and, and so on. So um, has been, yeah, important to look at this different way of seeing the issue. Javier, I don't know how to do this again. Sorry. I don't know. I'm lost. I don't see the mouse. That's the problem. So then maybe in this is this one. Thank you. It's hard not to become pessimistic. Uh, it, I think it's, it's reasonable uh, to feel that way. Um, yeah, so the reason also we do this um, series of documentaries is really to, um, on one side, go deeper in, in these questions and involve architects to really think with us, not really a solution, but how you frame these issues differently. On the other side is to um, also include the voices of the ones that are actually affected by this condition. So uh, you didn't see so much in the trailer, but in the documentary, you actually, I would say the protagonists are really the homeless. And the Daniel Schwartz, who has been the director of the movie, has really insisted many times that, you know, to explain what is the condition of being homeless or living alone or being elderly in these movies should be themselves explaining it. So um, I think this is what has been uh, very interesting for us. And I have to say, from a curatorial perspective, you know, if you do an exhibition about such a subject, you're always um, at least one level dis in distance with this because you will always present photo taken by someone of this or a project by someone on this. While here we have been there doing the film ourselves. So we have actually been registering and being affected by this um, yeah, directly somehow. Um, this is another interesting project that also deal with this question of, of space and of use of space and somehow. And so this is um, a project uh, called Constellation House by Something Fantastic. And the way it's organized is that instead of thinking about, you know, apartment, 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 the question is about night floors and day floors. And so um, this, you have to read the column A, B, C, D. Like, so is the idea also of cyclic life? Like, so you might start, you are alone, then you marry your kids or you live with friends, I don't know. And so the idea is that the, there is a total flexibility. So your day component is on one floor and then the ninth is on another. You use the kind of stairs to go from one floor to the others. Um, this also creates a kind of maybe strange encounters in pajamas on the stairs with neighbors, but that's the 
uh, idea, but then is this idea of maybe can make it more efficient of like you might not have need a large day space, but you might want more night space and so on. And so then this can fluctuate the time you live in the in the building, but then can also fluctuate um, in terms of your economy of what you can afford and, and so on. So um, yeah, I think all this uh, research was really trying to kind of find architects and projects that are start to think in a more creative way, I would say, about all this condition and really putting together all this question and trying to find solutions that are not only valid spatially, but they're trying to kind of respond to all these all these questions. Um, <laughs> last this is the last movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we have been, with this last uh, movie, we have been thinking about the kind of aging population and other issues that is, it will become more and more present. And um, we have been thinking, also the COVID has proven, and I don't know how it was in Argentina, but this kind of traditional elderly home, they were just even a, a really the wrong typology because um, at least in, in Canada, so many people passed away because they were all together and they kind of contaminated each other. But um, I think, uh, so we, what we wanted really to look at were two, were also again, new typologies. And um, the movie starts with those two ladies there in Barcelona. I think there is a very interesting uh, city um, uh, project that really builds like, um, housing, kind of social housing for elderly. So the idea is that, you know, you might have only, you're alone, you only have your pension, and and with the kind of gentrification of the city, you are pushed back out of the city and so on. And so these houses are actually built in a way that so the elderly people can stay in their neighborhood and they can still have their kind of social life, their connection, going to the market, going to the bar they know, and so on. And uh, in interviewing the main person at the city who is in charge of this project, he is, is said, you know, we have imagined a kind of rotation so the people will leave when they pass away and they are seeing that people are living longer. It means that this the idea that are there, are together, they do activities, there is someone in the building who care for them and so on, has proven to become actually a much better strategy of really um, keep them engaged and keep them uh, healthier and live longer somehow. And then the other project we were um, interested in is a new typology that uh, is happening in Baltimore in the US and is uh, what they is called the care house. And uh, this is the idea of 
making living together um, the elderly people with also the care uh, takers that they will have their own apartment they can have live there they have their family living there and so the idea is that um, you you start to have a, again a very different um, um, exchange between those two communities the caretaker or they don't have to um, you know uh, one of the issues is like they leave in the morning, they come back very late at night, they don't really see their family. So the whole idea is like how this can work together. So I think in other things that I, I was looking when I was researching all these projects was really to think about how architecture can also respond to multiple questions at the same time. So this is not just a house for the elderly, but think also of the other population that is involved in that. And can these buildings response to the question of the elderly, but also the caretakers, what it means for, for the city and so on. So um, this is why, you know, in my first slides, I'd say there is a lot to grapple with for you architects, because I think the questions <laughs> that are coming to your table are now more and more and more and more complex, I, ha I have to say. So um, yeah, all of this is to say that I think um, that the society is really changing and there are many questions that are posing and I think it's, it's very important that architecture is there to support these changes or to give answer, to give a direction and um, yeah, and to kind of frame these moments and maybe with this also introduce new, new types but also new rituals that are also essential for our society to be what we are. Thank you. Thank you, Shavana, so much for your presentation. I always uh, love your um, optimism, uh, your critical optimism. In in architecture and not, not only in architecture per se, but in, in the changes that architecture can, can enhance. It's always very um, powerful to hear from the field So now we have some time for questions or for, for comments. I don't know who would like to start. Marcy? Well, first of all, uh, Shimana, thank you for coming. Uh, it's, it's just a question that came to my mind in uh, watching the, the lecture. And uh, it's related to, to content, because I can find like uh, two different groups of projects that you show us tonight. Uh, the first of, of them is related to organize someone else's content, like, or, or let's call it archive. Uh, the work that someone did and you uh, find a way to different creators and participants to, to create a point of view that uh, makes sense to the present to the present tense. But in the last uh, project that you show us, uh, you are not organizing someone else's content, but by but creating creating sorry a new one. So I would like to ask you to speak a little a bit about. Uh, uh, that shift and uh, what uh, does it uh, mean? Oh, thanks, Marcelo. Um, yeah, I think is um, I think you can really see, as you said it, as as two directions. Um, it's a very good point. I d I never thought about this as two distinct modes in a way. I think um, you know, as Isabella said. Um, the mission of CCA is making architecture public concern. That is a very good and generic mission somehow. And and so what we need to do is to translate it in, into okay what what this means. And um, I think you know the name of CCA is Canadian Center for Architecture. So in a way, the four for me is very important because it's not about architecture or on architecture. So you can even say. But the first public is architecture. And, and so somehow, like say, this research um, and many of the others we are doing is really to think, okay, what the, what, how we can provoke a different conversation in the field, in the discipline, and also involving 
other public that are not uh, the architects and, and somehow to reflect of like, you know, what are the changes that the society needs and want. And so I think um, in a way there is a kind of activist in a way, agenda of the institution of saying uh, we need to think about this um, issue now and um, we need to have architecture thinking about. And so, in the same way, the first work on the archive, I don't see it so differently because somehow in deciding to accept the donation of an archive, um, it means bringing in an agenda and a kind of work of someone and then in inviting those different architects is also bringing back to the kind of contemporary discourse and this is why for example in the out of the box I like you know like as Claudia is coming she's an historian but I like also that the practice is looking at, at the archives and reflecting on, on the archives as a kind of what it means for for their own agenda somehow so um, I still see this as an opportunity for the institution to say, okay, what are the important things now? Like, in, in a way, what are the figures or what are the researches? What are the, um, yeah, so, uh, but in a way, it, what is true that, let's say in the first one, we curate the curators, and in the second one, it's like we curate the topic. So there is a distinction as, as you made it, yeah. Like we are not, you're not deciding what Claudia will look, where here we have a much more <coughs> hands on direction somehow. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much again. And I have a I have two questions. The first one is maybe more related also to Marta's questions, maybe with a little twist, um, not about content, but about context, as the lecture is called. And I don't know how many decades it's been that Rancourt has said what context. So what has changed now in architectural thought, and how does an archive contribute to that um, shift? Um, that on the one hand. And on the other hand, that's a more technical question because you briefly mentioned about digitalization. And I think that's a very important topic for archives right now, also because they're disseminated in the world and documents travel and it's about accessibility. And so I was wondering maybe if you could tell us a little bit more about it. Sure. Yeah, context is a very dangerous word and charge it. Um, but I think um, I think when Ram said, in fact, the context was a moment where, yeah, wanted really to liberate from all this kind of pressure that sometimes was the, you know, the site. Um, again, when I started architecture in Milan at the Polytechnico, the first things you will do was the drawing of the site. You will, it's not possible even to think a project it was not like also was, you know, was a school where Aldo Rossi was very present as a, as a voice, but, but let's say the, the, this kind of, you know, a lot of the choices were derived by the, the context, but the context was more intended as also as a spatial um, force or maybe a program force or a kind of economic force. I think the big change now is that um, there are all these other discourses that are happening. And for me, the expanded of your context is like, you cannot not think about all these issues. You cannot not think about that some, you build a housing project and no one can afford it. Uh, so how you will integrate those questions in your way of thinking architecture now. Like you, and this is why I think it's a very charged agenda because you have to think about the environment. You have to think about the kind of happiness agenda. So people need to be happy in your building. You have to be thinking about all this diversity thing. You have to be thinking about affordability. I, I don't know. I think it's very hard to be an architect now, but this is the world we are in. So I think I think people can decide to not can have a, an answer like RAM, find the context, and maybe the architecture is fine too. Uh, but I maybe 
hope with an architecture that engage with the society that we live in and try to kind of figure out all those questions in special terms. Not that the architecture needs to solve those things, but at least think about those things. So that will be my approach to the context. In terms of digitization, um, yeah, it's fundamental uh, to give access, to give visibility. Uh, but I think we should not um, think that everything is solved with that. Um, first of all, um, you know, we... It's not that we, we, you know, we are not a kind of enterprise like Amazon who records, you know, what people um, download, look at. We don't do its data studies, but we actually every week see what people are searching in our website just to understand. And steadily has always been Fun Palace. Okay, so everybody's looking at Fun Palace. So. And in a way, the most requested image to be published by the City Archive is always the same Fun Palace image. That, by the way, is something big like this, and it's not even an original, it's a photograph of a drawing. So the problem of digitization is this, you put out an image and then people will just continue to ask that. It's just, so what we are doing now, we are going against the wave, we are digitizing all the things that nobody wants to see. And so we are hoping to kind of change the trend, also giving visibility to things that are not visible and actually start to see that you put out an image and people are like, oh, that's interesting. And then we will go deeper and requesting things and so on. So first of all, is the strategy of digitization. Architects, when they donate the archive, they think you will digitize everything. It's impossible, first of all. Also, I think on contemporary practices, if I think at the archive of CISA, it's like, what is the value of digitizing a plan where there are so many books where the same plan has been already published millions of times. And so what, what this will give to have that image digitized is already, again, from perspective of an institution that is about research, doesn't really lead uh, anything to anything to have the same images repeated around. So if you think, okay, I have an archive, so we digitize a plan and a section for each project where there is the croquis. Sorry, so why we should do that? So I think the work that we're doing, for example, with the Swiss Fine and Tell is to give, is to digitize things that are less visible, correlated things. Now, the difficulty with the archive is that, you, you know, you have a folder and then inside the folder are a lot of things. And what is incredible about the physical experience is that you start to think, oh, okay, they have a plan, then there is a letter, a brochure, they went to an event, a photo, and then as a scholar, you are seeing this all together. Now, if you digitize, these are singular objects that you kind of lose this connection. So I think it's very tricky, the digitization, and I think a real research should always happen in, in a physical term, but the, the, an intelligent digitization might help people to then you know, discover things and go further in their... Um, yeah, in their research and quest. Um, yeah, so at the CCA, we digitize around 5,000 objects a year. So the question, we can digitize the double, but the problem is the data. So, you know, the scanner can do much more, but the problem here is the description. And as you know, even if we are a visual institution and repository, the search is still with words. So if I describe this image and say, eating around the sushi, around the, a plant, I might not find it if I'm looking for, you know, apartment, tiny apartment in Tokyo, because the words are not the right one. So this question of description is still a key thing in the discovery. So it's not only about digitization, it's how you describe the things if you tag them, how much you describe them and so on. So we now started a pilot project with Princeton, with uh, Sylvia Levin, about machine learning. And it was very complex because Sylvia wanted to start with the most complicated thing that is trees. And it, as we know, trees are not drawn in a standard way. So each architect made the trees as they wish. So 
is not something that something that a machine can recognize. It will say, I don't know, toilet will be all drawn drawn my my domain the same way. So um the question here is like if you have a plan as you have it in your archive, you will say ground floor plan or villa, whatever. You will not speak about the trees, even if the trees are very present in the drawing. So if you are a researcher who are interested in the evolution of how trees are drawn or actual trees about, I don't know, fig tree in architecture, whatever, um, you will not find the material. So now we were thinking, okay, let's start from the trees and you teach a machine. So you feed the machine thousands of drawings and the machine has to recognize the trees. Now, first thing is how you teach a machine because the idea you don't teach to find a tree, you teach how a tree is. And so for the machine here is, I don't know, a conjunction of two lines in it, like, so it's very complex. Like we had, I don't know many people working on this computation at Princeton, I don't know, anyhow. The great team worked it out and the machine was able to recognize some trees. So that's in a, in a way will be the future where you can say, okay, I want to have all drawings where I can see, I don't know, the use of bricks or things like this. And so you as a cataloger, you just still, or an archivist, you just describe this as a facade of a building. But then there are all these other things that machine can find. And so can say, I want to see all the drawings with bricks in the CC archives. And then poof, these are happening. I mean, this will be the hope. And I don't know if it will be useful at the end. I don't know. I'm still skeptical, but let's see. <laughs> I don't know if I answer. I have a question about um, the videos, about the, you were trained as, a, as an editor that, that then became a sort of curator and cultural producer. And now with this new with this new stage, we decided to use film as a way of uh, documenting architecture. That was quite new because film, uh, even in the exhibitions at the at the museum, uh, wasn't so so common. And I wanted to ask you, uh, what was your, why did you choose this medium? How was this idea of co-directing or, or not doing the movie yourself, but finding a filmmaker and curating a film in a way. How was that experience? Um, yeah, it's true. It's a kind of new new path for myself and other curators at SCA. And um, and um, I think the idea was really to um, find a medium that is um, on one side can be more near the questions, more near the architecture, where you can hear the voices of the makers and the users all at the same time. Um, but also even pushing this kind of an activist agenda even further. Um, I, you know, in starting the work, I read this book that, you know, is saying that if you see a documentary, um, if, you, if you hear a person talking about the subject, or if you hear a podcast, or if you saw a, say, uh, see a movie, or you see a documentary, the, the percentage of the shift of your thinking, if you see a documentary, is much higher. Because you're not hearing me saying, oh, we have to fight homeless. You are actually hearing the homeless saying, what is this condition? What, so it's actually moving the, the questioning and the thinking much more than if I'm talking to you or explaining who this. So in a way, this combined the idea of like how we go deeper in the subject, how we also have um, the users present, this complexity between, you know, who think about the architecture and use it, and this kind of activist agenda, I think, has been all the thing. Now, I don't know anything about mm, movie making, and so from the beginning, we say we need to work with a film director. So. I'm working more with the team on the kind of research and, and choose the, the maybe the architectural projects to feature or some of the architectural thinking, but the film director is really the film director. And so, first of all, he's very skeptical of architects. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it goes in and it's like, I will see if this is really good. Um, uh, and um, yeah, and I think he has been 
also um, the right person to, on one side, you know, include these other voices in a way. The architects are there, their architecture is there, but really there is also much more. And also to have a kind of emotional uh, connection that I think I will not have been able if I would be myself doing it. Yeah, so I think this is, and, and really understanding the medium as a kind of, if you do a movie, like how you, yeah, how you can moderate all those aspects in, in order that the, there's no boring, that the, 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 you have a kind of, yeah, kind of emotional connection with the subject. Yeah. So, there's any other questions in the audience? Um, are, you, are you familiar with the case of the Louis Vagram archive? Okay, um, I wanted to ask you because I think from your talk you have uh, very different values um, than the people that bought that archive. Uh, but I wanted to ask how do you deal with the responsibility of owning the archives that you own and you know the the power that that holds over you know the public and the previous owners of the archives if you give that any thought yeah um no thanks a lot for the question um well the responsibility is huge uh, because in a way um in accepting the donation um and you think well, people are donating so you know we should just be happy but the responsibility is huge in in being sure that the material is there in perpetuity so this is the there's not an end there is not an expiration day we say we keep for 10 years and we will see so it's, it's in perpetuity so financially is is a long term commitment so that's that's is one thing and the second thing is in a way is the legacy of the person um so um what we think is in the moment that the that um you know the previous owner decide to donate this to the CCA we have the responsibility to share it uh, and to give access um to it as much as possible so not only we say the things is here but we have a research program that I suggest everyone to look at with you know many grants opportunities so we are supporting the life of it, the kind of care of it, but also the research position, the curatorial work, the loaning to other institutions, and so on. So there is no restriction on our side in terms of, let's say, the only things would be if you want to do a commercial use, um, side publication, say, I want to do T-shirts, we will normally not give you an image, um, or um, if there is a economies use of of the archive both in terms of um, material like so so we might not lend it to a place where the conditions are not good that the, the, the objects will ruin it somehow or if curatorially there is a kind of position that is very I don't know like is kind of um, I believe threatening, I don't know, something, we might um, not be so keen in, in participating in. But we normally don't even enter in that. It's really like there is there and has to be used. I think the, the big change in this, and I think I see it now with the work of Amancio, is in the moment that the material came from the family, and this is typical of, of a family, um, having the material and then coming to an institution, obviously this is now there. Everybody can read it and can read it very differently. So we don't control the read you will do on that. So you might decide to describe or to define the work in a very different way that has, has been described until now. So there is a risk implied in putting it there also for the donor because then the, this is not is not controlled anymore. Like an, ar an architect, until the things are with him, control what is published, you know, what is the material have access, and so on. Now the material is there, and people start to see everything. And then, you know, when our an archive comes, I was saying this to Isabella, obviously, so much material 
that you know there are also things and maybe an architect doesn't remember they are there anymore. Like we find a lot of love letters um, that you know are there or financial things that you know we also have you know top stories of like you know question of labors and things like this and all that is traceable. So there is. I would say there is a risk for the person, but there is a kind of eternity of the legacy somehow. So what we think we need to do is that, especially, you know, at the beginning of CCA was buying our, buying materials. Now we only accept, we only can go, we don't have any more the budgets. We only go for donation. But the things we give, in back, get, we give back is this access, this curatorial work, this editorial work. And that's, I think, is the trade somehow. Thanks a lot, Shavana. See you everyone tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks.